And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, as always, is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. The defense and the, and the plaintiff may have rested on the Depp Heard trial, but you can see that we're far from far from stopping our judging. <laughs> the cr the crusade never ends. Indeed. But now I know I know some might some of you might be thinking, didn't we do a valley that judged on Wednesday? That was an emergency valley. The sole reason that was done was because I was because I got thrown off guard by the Bebop announcement. I didn't I didn't know that was coming. I doubt most other people did either. I did. But <laughs> cons now we do have an we do have another longer form one planned for the, for June. But to close, but to close out the month of May, I thought it'd be prudent of us to tackle a genre that we really haven't dipped into yet. We've dipped into plenty of fantasy, some science fiction, some science fiction fantasy, um, a little bit of cyberpunk here and there. We haven't really done much in the way of superheroes. Superman. And I know. I know I know it's easy to say that that superhero burnout is happening right now. I only partially agree with that. Do I think that, do I think that people are getting burned out on the on the um MCU conveyor, conveyor belt? Yes. Do I think people are getting burned out on superheroes as a whole? Not necessarily. Especially when, especially with how successful, um, no, how successful um, No Way Home was. And as someone who actually did watch No Way Home recently, um, I can say that it's actually a really good movie. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, th and well, just just as a bit of an aside, um, Zan and I got in, got dragged into a lengthy argument about Moon Knight and. I had tr I had tried to posit the notion that as for however good you may think you may think that Spectre was in that mo in that miniseries that wasn't Moon Knight and one of the things I wanted to make clear about is that the the template that the MCU has developed for how for how it wants all of its stories to go doesn't fit with every character they throw in it. Yep. You especially can't really do a bombast heavy story with somebody whose whose best storytelling has always been very introspective. Introspective and insane. Mhm. Mm um whether whether it be whether it be the idea of faith or the idea of of trauma, it's always very introspective. And not really one that works well, that works well with the big bombast crossover stuff. I haven't hell. I haven't seen him do. I haven't seen him do a proper crossover in years. Most of the time, he just does his own stuff. Yep. And the that's all. That's this was something that I had warned about when tr when trying to streamline the process of these films much in the same way that a lot of people complain that every Harry Potter movie after the second one kind of felt the same largely because what after one had finished they were already starting pre-production on the next one mm -hmm. and well they had to they had to keep up with the kids growing up yeah and I'm, I'm not um, I'm not denouncing that I'm just no I'm just noting it but you know, the real the real question I had for that one was why didn't they just do it Peter Jackson style? What three long ass movies? 
No, uh, filming all of it in one long ass uh, um, series. Because Warner Brothers is not exactly known for making smart decisions. Plus, I don't think all the books are out at that point. So no, they, no, they weren't. So you would have ended up with a Akira situation. <laughs> hey, and Akira was a great movie. Maybe those movies would have been better if they'd done it that way. Oh, it I want. I want to. I want to make this clear. Akira as a film is an absolute classic. But when you compare it to the when you compare it to the story as the full story instead of the half story that they had at the time, one it's no comparison. Well, and it's unique in the fact that half the manga was written. They made the movie, which had some stuff that wasn't in the manga, that the manga then used as inspiration to finish. Mm -hmm. It's a weird. It's a weird situation. However, rails. <laughs> yeah. So. For this one, we are tackling Champions, which is one of the most venerable superhero RPGs over over the last forty years, and be and beyond that, for that matter. But I'd I will I've mentioned this before, but I got started with Hero with Hero System slash Champions fairly late. I didn't I um. I didn't really I didn't really start with Hero System until um 4th edition. Mhm. Mm which is what and I may I mainly got into it thanks to Michael Serbrook and the many 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 um write-ups he did with Hero System 4th edition. Uh, but fortunately Hero System is is not Hero System is not really a game that you can really play Edition Wars with. Mm -hmm. Now, some hardcore folks will will certainly make an attempt, but the fact of the matter is, Hero System doesn't do massive sweeping changes between editions. It would be it would be like trying to play Edition Wars with Savage Worlds. Are there differences? Yeah. Are are the differences enough to start to start a fight about? Not really. Oh, of course there. Of course, there's the weirdness where Hero System originally started out as champions before Spiral. But you know how it is with that thin line between superhero games and Universal games. Yep. And. As far as why I want, when I saw a few months back that that they had done this starter set called Champions Begins, I I had I had put this into consideration, and the big reason for that is I do think champ I do think the hero system gets a bit of a bad rap, much in the same way that GURPS does, because. Something that we've, something that you and I have seen plenty of times is people very much overrating or even overreacting to complexity in game rule sets. In both directions, too, whether it's more or less complex. Yeah. Now, I've gone on record as saying I prefer crunch medium, and I've, cer I've certainly picked, and stuff like GURPS and Phoenix Command are, are still my whipping boys. But that does not mean I can. That does not mean that there aren't games on the opposite end that ha that have earned my that haven't earned my ire. I've made it very clear I have serious problems with fate, for instance. Mm. Serious problems. That's an understatement. Not just not just with the not just with the um, moral grandstanding that fate. That Evil Hat Games has been doing lately, or the or the dr ball drop that they did with Fate of Cthulhu, which I've ar which I've already covered, but more to do more to do with the guidance and the fact that the fact that upon character creation they outright it seems like they outright discourage customization, given that whole relationship between stunts and refresh. And 
the argument that I often hear is you're going to be get, you're going to be gaining and losing fate points pretty pretty regularly throughout play. Mm -hmm. But I find that to be a bandage. Especially especially since taking more stunts means that you lose refresh, and I've never and I've never seen enough justification for that. And for the, for the record, in Fate, Refresh determines how many Fate points you'll get back. Mm -hmm. Fate points, of course, being your extra effort system. And I've already made clear that I also have issues with how the aspect system in Fate doesn't provide a whole lot of guidance as far as what are good or bad aspects. Yeah, it's a, it's a hand-breaking moment, as you put it. Mm-hmm. And since Thirteenth Age actually gave the, actually gave a decent set of examples on the one unique thing, I can't. It's not something I can let slide. Mm -hmm. Plus, you and I have um, have made clear that we don't care for the i we don't care for the idea of of game of games relying on on GM or player experience to fill in the holes. Yeah, every every game. Everybody who makes a game system, no matter what system it is, so long as it's the first entry in your system, obviously for things where there's expansions, there's some expectation that you have the core. Mm -hmm. um, but every system should be approaching its system documents as if the person who's picking up that book is picking up a TTRPG book for the first time ever. Period. End of story. Every system. This is This is, in my mind non-negotiable because you never know what somebody's first experience is going to be mm -hmm. so when you fail to do that um yeah you lose points yep now that brings that brings us to this project because what i really wanted to sh what i really wanted to show is that games like champions and games like gurps are not a, are not as daunting as pe as people think that they are, and moreover, I also want to de I also want to address to address this narrative that I've been seeing, where sim where quote unquote simpler games are almost fetishized. It's I better to make the game simple to play. I don't have any problem with mechanical simplicity. But I do have a problem whenever whenever it's argued that it's better or allows for better role playing. That actually reminds me of a point I made earlier today. I I think most people think of role play backwards. They a lot of people that I see playing TTRPGs that don't have a lot of experience or only have, you know, moderate experience rather than the extensive heavy experience you and I have. They, they tend to think about what they want their character to do. They then look over their character sheet to determine if they have the ability or skill or whatever necessary to do that. And only then do they decide to roleplay it, if it's valid. Um, instead, they should be roleplaying what they want to try and do. And the GM should be checking that against whether that's even legal within the rules. And if it is legal within the rules, whether that even needs a check. Mm -hmm. At that point, if it needs a check, the GM sets up the check. It's up to to between the GM and the role player to determine if there are relevant skills that can modify things in or against their favor. And at that point, you make the role. Mm -hmm. The role play should be the primary component by which you express what you are doing and how you are doing it. I look at that as... A fail as a failure of um, not necessarily a failure, but more, but more of that, more of a consequence of pe of people using the most ubiquitous role playing game as as if it, as if it's this perfect introduction. Yeah, and, and it's really not. It re and it really it one it really isn't, and two. When you have that kind of attitude, you don't you don't end up you don't coach yourself out of bad habits, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you end up getting in that in that kind of thing. 
Also, I do. Also, I do want to slightly correct myself. Um, because I had I had said champion. I said champions is the has been has been a venerable name with supers for twenty years. Um, champions first came out in nineteen eighty one. Mm -hmm. So I'm off by a few years. You said forty, and that's about forty. I could have swore I said twenty. No, you said forty. Now, anyway. Champions Begins is split into four books, and obviously we're not going to go through all four of them tonight. Um, there's the Player Book, the Game Master Book, the Character Book, and the Villain Book. And incidentally, I do I do like the way the covers are designed for each. The, well, yeah, they're pretty. With, with the whole thing of spl of splitting the cover art four ways like that. Yeah. I, uh, it's almost like they're trying to prescribe how you would read it, though, as well, since the section for Game Master is, has the leftmost section of the cover, and the, then the two middle sections are on character and villain book, mm -hmm. and then the player book, it has the last section. Um, if anything, it kind of reminds me of the color-coded issues for Deathmate. Okay. You can see that. You know where there were a set of there were a set of middle ch there was a beginning chapter and an end chapter and a set of middle chapters that could be read in any order. Well, yeah. that was the intent. Except except the the problem was the idiot was ridiculously late to the point that one of, to the point that one of the guys from Valiant um did a sit in did a sit in at <laughs> at um Liefeld's house and wouldn't leave until he got the inks. Yep. Which. As somebody who can be a petty motherfucker himself, I can appreciate that. You would. <laughs> <laughs> largely because it's so largely because it's something that I would do. But because of the fact that we can't go that going through all of all four books in is something we couldn't do in one go and I have no desire to make this a two-parter. We're mostly going to be focusing on the player book, which is only 20 pages. We'll dip into the Game Master book if need be. And the character and villain book is ju is just um, write-ups, so there's not a whole lot of reason to dig deep into either of those. Yeah, those are the write-ups just for the the pre-gens, right? The pre -gen on one hand, the pre-gens, although we will, I, I think we will comment on them. And on the other hand, the... NPCs. Mm -hmm. But it but it opens up with with the following. Welcome to the best game of your life. Okay, that's a that's a bold that's a bold statement. By now you've probably seen several superhero films and television shows and you may have even read some comic books. They're pretty fun to watch and enjoy. Action movies with extra powers and a code of ethics that guides their life. Good versus evil, saving people, fighting for justice in a world that seems to not have any. It's great fun. Ever wanted to be someone like that? Even just as a kid? Here's your chance. Also, I do mm. love I do love the um photo that that we have on the bot that we have on the bottom corner. Yeah. <laughs> um What is Champions? Champions is a role-playing game for playing out the sorts of adventure stories featured in com comic books. Da da da. Going into the base, going into the basics. Although I do want to highlight this part. With Champions, you can strap on that power armor, pick up that magical hammer, tie on that cape, and go fight the bad guys right right in your home. This introductory pack is a tutorial that lets you learn how the game works and how to get into there, in punching bad guys one step at a time until you know the system and how to do it all. So let's get started in a whole new world where you are the superhero. Maybe not in that costume, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh. See, then it it brings up that it's not it's not focused on gaining levels, glory, treasure, or anything like that, but simulating action and adventures in comic books and superhero films. Um. And as well as go, as well as going into rewarding and doubling down on the fact that this is a soup that this is a superhero game. You're supposed to be playing superheroes. Yeah, 
I love the fact that they have that little blurb about don't get carried away with the merchandising, mm-hmm. which is a funny way to point that out because Tiger and Bunny, everybody. Yeah. Ever wanted to see a superhero that has the Coca-Cola brand across his chest? Mm-hmm. Tiger and Bunny is that world. Yep. Oh. Then, then a further thing on playing that role, and if it's if it sounds like I'm skimming over some of some of these parts, a lot of it is is the typical what is a RPG, what is a GM, and and the like. And truth be told, whenever I do my reviews, I skim over these kind of things because it because rarely does it tell me anything new. Or yeah. it, it's it's important to have it there. It's just not it's just not all that important for review purposes. I will admit I like the way that this is written in a very informal style. Nice. Instead of being written like a textbook. Yeah. Um, also, the section on the GM, I like the whole "Don't hate the game, master." Um, no, hate hate the game, master. It only feeds us and our sadism. <laughs> I know some of you may say, "I'm a GM and I'm not a sadist." Yes, you are. You just don't want to admit it. There's, there's, there's two types of game masters, people. Sadists and fucking liars. Mm-hmm. Oh. Then a, seg- a segment called Team Player about, about well... About, being a player. Yeah, be- being a team player. Um, I.e. Don't, don't, go, don't go in acting like you're a solo hero. Yeah, if... if- a big point of ensemble casts is that first word, ensemble. You're part of the ensemble. You are not a solo hero. Although I'm sure you could write a scenario for solo heroes if you wanted to. Duets are certainly not unheard of. So then we go with enough already. And it says, I agree. Let's get to the game. The adventure is set up in several parts. Typo. The first scenario has some basic concepts and a simple plot to get things rolling. Later parts add more info and things you can do as this story unfolds. Jeez, there's a typo. So let's open the first Ash-T-E. page. T-E. Yeah. So, so let's open the first page of this comic and get started. Then, so the first thing that they bring up is the is the available roster. The pre-gen characters. Mm-hmm. I want to. I want to read the roster. Can I do that? Go ahead. All right. First, we have Apex. Strong, can fly, and is tough to hurt. A basic superhero, also known as legally distinct Superman. <laughs> then we have Avenger. The war is over, but the fight against crime never ends, and that shield always comes in handy. Legally distinct Cap. Doctor Nope. Spiders might be creepy, but this character is just stylish with spider powers. Why would you refer to Doc Ock with your legally distinct Spider-Man? Lionheart, a devastating fighter with deadly claws and fast healing and cat ears. Legally distinct Wolverine had better not re- beat real Wolverine or real Wolverine will cut his ears off repeatedly. <clears throat> Momentum. Do I need to say anything else about legally distinct Flash? <laughs> He's fast as a blur and agile to match. Spellbinder. The eerie and awesome power of magic is at your command with this character. Now, that here's the thing. They, they don't mention the, the source of the magic, so this could be either legally distinct Doctor Strange or legally distinct Doctor Fate. Take your, po- take, take your poison. <clears throat> both, take your poison. Both. Both is good. Both. Both is good. Yes. <laughs> Starblaze. Flight is great, and blasting bad guys is fun, but that force field keeps you safe. Again, we have a twofer here. Legally distinct Green Lantern, legally distinct Captain Marvel. I would... I was, I would gonna, choose... I was actually going to say Nova. I mean, you're not wrong, but I uh, I, I choose neither and go with, with the, uh, the Dark Horse pick of legally distinct Starfire. 
Fair. <clears throat> Street Knight. God damn it. Is he is he brooding? Is he is he dark? <laughs> is he some sort of dark and brooding knight? <laughs> May be just a mere mortal, but the gadgets and skills make all the difference in their endless war against crime. Otherwise known as legally distinct, I am Batman. Trooper! That is the most generic fucking name. Uh, this power-armored character has amazing technology and uses it to fight the bad guys. I think this is supposed to be legally distinct Iron Man, but... But there's a lot of power armored characters in comics. Who's to say? Vulcan. E excuse me. Let me guess. He he wields it. He wields a hammer, and he might be a god. Oh look, maybe Vulcan isn't really a god, but Vulcan can sure make and fix just about anything and fight toe to toe with their hammer against anyone. Legally distinct Thor. Really. <laughs> So as you can see, you can pick all your favorite superheroes in generic, great value brand flavors. Each each of these. Oh. And we'll get we'll get to the character sheets later. Speaking of which, the character sheet. When you pick two you like, your GM will give will give you a sheet for that character. Take a good look at it. It's got a lot of useful info on it, stripped down to the basics to give you just to give you what you. Give you to give you what you need for now. Sorry, this got screwed up for a second. There's a lot more to these characters, like all the math and special information, but you don't need any of that right now. Your character sheet has colors and sections. That's to make finding stuff easier. What each section refers to is described below, but the colors can help you find parts you need. Then we see the example with Doctor Nope. Um, I do like this simplified take on the on the Hero System character sheet. Nice. And getting personal, each character each character has available has information about what their special and unique abilities are. Each chapter, some new abilities will be added. The front of the character sheet shows the basic stats, and the back explains what these abilities are and what they d. Typo. There have been a lot of typos on this single page. But what your chosen character's personality is like, why they are heroes, etc. Well, that's left blank. For the purposes of this tutorial, it's not terribly important, but it's fun to give them a life of their own. So that character you pick to play, what are they? What they are like is up to you. Are they bold, flirtatious, silly, dedicated, studious, whatever? That's up to you and how you want to play them. Just remember these are heroes who are there to do good and help people. And they have special individual powers and abilities to use in that goal. I choose Street Knight, and I'm going to play him like the most flamboyantly friendly person ever. He tries to make friends with everybody that isn't a villain on the streets. Um, I'm going to traumatize Bruce Wayne forever. That's what I'm trying to do. You just want to have you just want to have Bruce Wayne. Meet, you just want to have you just wanted to have a a supers version of Forze. I. Will not confirm that that's an idea I had, but if I were going to have that idea, it would be using Trooper. Power Armor, Monk. Now, now all I'm thinking of is, I'll defeat you with the power of friendship and this gun I have. I mean... <laughs> Gentaro could literally do that. He did have a mini gun switch. Any, anyways, um, so first we have chapter one. So what's all this stuff on the character sheet? First we have characteristics. This is the green section. Each chapter will expand on your characteristics, but from the beginning you start with three primary characteristics and five secondary ones. Primary ones are strength, dexterity, and intelligence. Each of these has a role associated with it, listed as a number or less, such as 11 or less. The higher these are, the better. How good is my stat? For your primary characteristics, the ones with a role listed by them, you can get a feel for how good they are based on how they rank up against ordinary people. A normal person like you or I has an 8 in each of these primary characteristics. 
a little baby might have a strength of one or two. The maximum competition level best in the world in any characteristic for a normal human being is 23. Everything above that, anything above that is truly superhuman. So if we're using Superman, like the actual Superman, not great value Superman above, um, he's going to be way above 23 in literally everything because he ha as far as we've seen with his comic feats, he's got super strength, he's got super reflexes, and he's super smart. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the hero basics, a 3d6 roll. You'll have a bunch of six siders in your house, and if not, hey, they're cheap at the local one buck store. So take a look at the roll next to that characteristic, such as intelligence. Roll those three dice and add them up. Is that total equal to or lower than the roll listed? Then you succeeded. Is it higher? Well, better luck next time. All the skill rolls and attack rolls in this game work the same way. Three dice, roll them, and aim for low. For now, when your GM asks you to make a strength roll, you would basically know what to do. Grab those 3d6 and rattle them around. Now, you have a few other characteristics that don't have a roll. Secondary characteristics. The next five determine how you attack or otherwise act in combat. Offensive combat value, OCV, and defensive combat value, DCV. These are used to, to see if you hit or avoid being hit. Physical defense and energy defense reduce incoming damage of the given type. Speed is how often and how soon you act in combat. Stun is how much damage you can take before your character is knocked out. If your stun reaches zero, you're out cold. Knocked out player characters get up at the end of combat. And so let's let's see. Let me see. So, for example, a for example, um, Apex, um, OCV five, DC DCV five, physical and energy defense is thirty. His stun, his or her stun is forty two. Um, of course, it's forty two. Yeah. His um, his strength score is fifty, which which means that his roll is. For for him to for him to pass a strength roll, he'd have to roll eighteen or less. <laughs> Which means he always passes strength rolls. Penalties notwithstanding. Yes. Now then we have Unmo unmodified rolls. He will always pass, mm -hmm. at least when it comes to strength. Yeah. Then we have powers and abilities. This is the blue section of the sheet. For many characters, this section is blank in this chapter, since most of your abilities are just moving and hitting things. And that's covered in later areas of this tutorial. Then, moving on up, the purple section shows how your character can move around. Some have unusual movement abilities like flight, but everyone can run and jump. You can swim too, but that's not going to come up in this adventure. The distances listed by each of these movement abilities on your sheet are how far you can move in a single phase of action. If it says 12 meters, if it says 12 meters, you can move up a maximum of 12 meters in a single movement action. All the movement abilities work this way, even weird ones like teleportation. That's teleportation, Kyle. Yes, I know it's telekinesis in the song, but I'm making a joke. Fuck you all who don't know Tenacious D. You'll learn eventually. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. So then we get to combat. And finally, there's a section that shows different types, different kinds of attacks you can make in combat and the base OCV roll you have with each. That's the red section of the character sheet. So to go back to Apex, he has he has the punch, he has the punch maneuver at as part of his as for for his combat, as well as the circled number, as well as the numbers that he acts on when it comes to speed. Which will get which we'll get into later. Um, as far as movement goes, he has twenty five meters of flight. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we go with the other side. Now flip the character sheet over. See all that stuff? That's a quick explanation of what each of your abilities this chapter does. Energy blast, teleport, invisibility, whatever. You can see what they do and how they work. So that's your character sheet and the very basics. So next we have fighting words, i.e. 
Now we get into combat. So let's talk about the very basics of combat. It's not a superhero story without a fight, after all. And you'll be doing some fighting this adventure. I don't know, a superhero... We've seen plenty of we've seen plenty of modern Marvel think that think that it's better to be doing a whole lot of talking than ma than fighting villains. I mean, if modern Marvel were doing it right, there would be talking while fighting villains. That's how comic books work, people. Mm -hmm. So, like like it says in, above in the red section, you rolled a hit with three d six, trying to roll low. The lower the better to with with to hit and skill rolls. The higher the better for damage. It's pretty easy to remember. You're trying to roll low to hit and then roll high to do as much damage as possible when you hit. Yes. Oh. When it's your chance to attack, you cho choose the maneuver you want to use from the red section on your character sheet and roll 3d6. The base chance to hit is modified by the other guy's DCV and circumstances, but you don't need to worry about all that. That's the GM's headache. You roll, and then they'll let you know if you connect it or not. Each attack you can do is listed in the red combat section of your character sheet. Take a look at it. If you hit, then ch then you check out the ability you hit with. The maneuvers listed give you the basics. Blast, punch, stab, etc. What does that maneuver do? That's what you roll. You can see the OCV listed in the combat section, showing what your accuracy is with that maneuver. Right now, they're all pretty much the same, but in later chapters, they will vary by how hard a move is, how far away a target is, etc. Rolling to hit is pretty easy. See that number next to the maneuver in the OCV column? Roll 3d6 and try to get as low as possible. For each point below that, num that number, you hit that DCV. So if it says 16 or less from your OCV, then roll a 3d6 and subtract what you got from that roll. If you rolled a 10, then you hit a 6 dcv or lower. So going to him again. So his apex has the punch maneuver. The OCV for that is 16. Well, the OCV is 5 and he, uh, he rolls 11. Or, or why does he add that to 11? What? Um, wait, where, where did you get the, his, oh, his punch maneuver has a five OCV. So he adds 11 to that for a total of 16. Yep. They just, they just put that, they just put the straight up OCD, OCV column just to simplify things. Yeah. I was reading the example from the player book. Mm -hmm. So let me do a, let me do a little 3d6 roll. So I got, I rolled 3d6 and I got 11. So obvious, obviously, obviously that would hit. That would hit. That would hit. So, ele so eleven minus sixteen. That is that that has a difference of five. Mm -hmm. Sixteen minus eleven. Mm -hmm. The example in the book uses minus that he rolls up a nine. So sixteen minus nine is seven, mm -hmm. and so he can hit anything with a DCV of seven or lower. It is a, it is a little bit, is it is, it is a little bit da it is a little bit daunting. But the the approach that the approach that I go that I go with it is that you are that I'd say that I'd say this is this kind of reminds me of victory. This always kind of reminded me of victory points in the sense that. It is that you're gonna have a you're gonna have a bigger range to deal with the lower that you go. So just just going up just going under the tar just going under the target number isn't always enough. Yeah, in in this case, specifically for combat, you want to roll as low as you can just so you have a higher amount of DCV you can hit. Then we get to stun. Let's say your attack does 10d6 damage. So get all the dice you have and count out 10 of those six-siders. Champions players have a lot of six-siders, and as any gamer will tell you, you can never have too many dice. This is true. I have four bags of them. Mm -hmm. Roll all 10 and count them up. Don't feel bad. For some psychological reason, it's easier to read people 
other people's dice than your own. I have no idea why that is, but there are some useful tricks like grouping dice in tens for quicker adding. Tell the GM the total you roll, that's how much stun damage you did. What is stun damage? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's non-lethal damage. You have, the, you have a stun stat in your green characteristics section. See down there in the bottom of the list, stun is how much damage it takes to knock you out. When it reaches zero, you're taking a nice nap. Later we'll get into lethal damage, but that's for another chapter. So Apex has stun of 42. Meaning that if anyone anyone wants to take him down, they're going to have to deal a total of 42 stun. Mm -hmm. so, then we, so then we have getting defensive. But fear not, when the bad guy uses their, their attack against you, you have defenses to protect yourself with, just like they do. The GM took the target's defenses off your 10d6 attack and applied the remainder to, remainder to the bad guy. Now it's time for you to do the same. A different bad guy rolls to hit and succeeds, blasting you good for 10d6 himself. Hey, it's no fun if they aren't challenging, right? Ah, take that, journalist. <laughs> Can you get through the Cuphead tutorial, Dean Takahashi? So the GM rolls the dice and tries not to giggle as they count up the numbers. Absolutely ridiculous. Most GMs can hold a poker face. That's what yeah. And if they and if you can't, that's why you buy a GM screen. Or both. Hold the poker face and giggle when when you think it'll most unnerve your players. Sometimes just rolling when you don't need to is enough to do that. <laughs> yes, we've we've had that discussion before, Monk. We do that all the time. I don't know what you're talking about. I I refuse to incriminate myself. This ain't a court of law, Monk. There ain't no Fifth Amendment here. Oh. So the GM rolls the dice and, as, as I said, and tries not to giggle as they count up the number. It's a perfectly average attack. 35 stun. That's going to leave a mark. Never fear, though. Your character has defenses. The GM tells you that it's an energy attack as opposed to a physical attack. Let's say your character has 18 energy defense. That's pretty good, but it's still going to sting. So here we get a bit mathy, but at least it's easy math. You take the total done to you, then you subtract your defense for a total of... You can use your toes too. Yep, 17 stun. And Avenger, ha well, Avenger has 30 stun, so they can take a pretty good hit and keep moving. You subtract that damage done from the, to from the total for... An uncomfortable 13 stun left over. Best to avoid taking another hit like that. And that's I'm sure there's also... Go ahead. I'm sure we'll get into it later, but I'm, uh, there's probably a way to recover stun in the middle of battle. You never know. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And that's how the basics work. Roll to hit, roll damage, defenses are subtracted, damage is dealt to stun total. Super easy, you know the rest. And we get to um, rushing. Go ahead. I've um, I've come up with an uncomfortable character roster for three of the characters above. Momentum is blue. <laughs> I'm not touching that. But he likes to roll around at the speed of sound. <laughs> and Starblaze is silver. As I said, I'm not touching that. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Then we go to rushing around today, which is all, which is all about um, movement. Uh, you can move any increment you want, just not just the full amount every phase. A particularly useful concept to remember is the half move, which means move up to half your full move. Looking at the green section of your character sheet, you can see that it's got movement in a special section. Each kind of movement you can use with your character has a number listed by it in meters, like 12 meters. And then eyes up. See in that green section on your character sheet where it says perception roll? 
That's used when your GM thinks you might have a chance of hearing, spotting, smelling, or otherwise perceiving something that wasn't very obvious. Anything obvious and clear, you can just sense without a roll. Perception rolls are pretty simple. You roll 3d6 and try to roll equal to or under that roll, that roll on your character sheet. It's based on your intelligence, so the smarter you are, the better you perceive. I, I don't like that. There are there are certain things that can affect your perception that have nothing to do with your intelligence. I'm willing to let it slide for the sake of simplicity here, but I can under I can understand that. I'm I'm guessing it would probably be addressed as a power or talent that you have if you if you have something other than your intelligence that affects that. Yeah. Like spidey uh, senses. Mm-hmm. Then we go with just going through a phase. And the last things to learn for this chapter are about when and how to act. People don't just go all at once in champions. They act based on how fast and able they are in combat. First, we have speed. Look at the block. The first on the block is speed, which gives a rating on how often you act in a 12-segment period called a turn. The higher the speed, the more often you move. Each segment is one second long. On your character sheet in red under the combat maneuvers, you'll see a bar that has 1 to 12 listed and some of the numbers circled. That's your speed broken down over the 12 segment turn. You get to do stuff on that circled segment. The segments you get to act on are called phases. Which phases does Apex act on there, Monk? 3, 6, 9, 12. Four times a, four times a turn? That's nice. Um... Uh, I'm per, I if I'm being honest I've I've come I've come to have a have a larger interest in phase design over um over the over the standard initiative. I know we're using initiative for our project, but we have our reasons for doing that. Yep. But I think that I think that a phase-based design might be might be easier for people to wrap their head around. In some cases, that's definitely sure. Um, I had used that. I had, I had used phases to describe how um, how ter how turn order works when I was when I was discussing role master and later on against the dark master. Mm -hmm. And of course, phases is how Final Fantasy One and Final Fantasy Ten do their turn order. Mm -hmm. uh, so next on the block is Dex, which tells you. When you move in a in a given phase, this only really matters if several people have their phase in the same segment, in which case go in order of highest to lowest decks. So there's your tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. Um. Then we have Eric the half a phase. Remember the half move bit above? Well, this is where it matters. Some actions take half your phase to do, so you can do two of them in one full phase. Stuff like moving half your distances really obvious, you can only do half of something twice. But attacking someone ends your phase, even if it's the first thing you do. Once you punch a bad guy, that's it for your actions, and it's on to the next character. And in this chapter, every attack takes a half phase. Putting two and two together, it makes sense that you can half move and attack. Two half phase actions ending with the attack. So if your character can move as much as 20 meters, then they can choose to instead move 10 meters first half and then attack second half. There are other bits about phases and actions that your GM knows and can handle, but this is all you really need to know. Is that where we should possibly look over in the GM's book real quickly? I'd say so, because one, once it gets to... because the next column um, covers, the advent, covers the adventure part, because like I said, this is split into several chapters, as if you're mm -hmm. doing a four issue mini series. Yeah. So on the <laughs> So So on the clock is the section we're gonna be looking at. Yeah, this actually let's... talks about phase economy. Yeah. So it goes how how long does this stuff take? When a character moves, does a speech, or checks things out with a perception roll when they attack, how long does that take? I mean, we 
we already have segments and faces and turns. Now we got to know all, how this breaks down, right? There are five terms that help make sense of time and champions. The first are actions in four lengths of time. Actions that take no time, these take up no time and can be done at any time, even when it's not your phase, like when a GM asks a player to make a roll or a PC makes a soliloquy. Zero phase actions, these take up none of the character's phase like a half move does, but can only be done in that character's phase at any time in that phase. Half phase actions, these take up half a phase and two can be done in a phase, attack, half move. Full phase actions, these take up more than half a fa more than a half phase action, i.e. full moves. The fifth, and the fifth is a special kind of half phase, and that is attack actions. These are when a character attacks a target and they make a half phase. Once a character makes an attack, that is the last thing they can do on that phase, other than actions that take, mo that take no time. Later there will be some attacks that take more than a half phase, but either way, attack actions are the last thing you can do on that phase. So, pretty straight. It is pretty straightforward on that on that front. Yeah. And the key. Also, the key thing that determines how how many times you can act is your speed, and it's ba it's basically the speed basically denotes how many phases you can act in. Yeah. Now, then we go to ch then we go to chapter two, which covers skills, opening it with skills to pay the bills. <laughs> But how do you do this? Well, in addition to role playing, have your character go go about and talk to people, cops until agents. Da da da. In addition to this, there are various skills you can have your character use to do the job as well. Skills are abilities that a character has learned over life that they can apply to find information, solve tasks, and obtain things like stealth or concealment. There are dozens of potential skills a character can learn. And when you get to making your own character, you can you can see a more complete list in Champions Complete, which I have. In this scenario, we're only going to look at the ones your characters have and will use. Skills show up in the blue section of your character sheet for this chapter. Looking at your character sheet, you can see the skills your character now has. Each role is given a a role of X or less, written written in the same manner as your attributes. So if it says twelve, if it says twelve, you need to roll twelve or less on a three d six to succeed. Of course, your GM might apply modifiers to that, which you just put it, you just put on that roll. So if the GM says make a conversation roll at minus one, then you subtract one from what you're trying to roll. Uh, ele that would be eleven in the above example, and roll your dice and try to beat that. Sometimes your GM will give a bonus if something is particularly easy to do. Let's see, then we mm -hmm. have your skill types, which are grouped into several different categories. You have your basic skills like persuasion and stealth. Oh, then there are skills like then there are things like knowledge and professional skills. Area knowledge, for example, means your character knows all about a region or place and can move around in it find things in it, and know history about it. If someone asks you how to get from point A to point B, your AK will determine if you know this. Knowledge skills are about things you know, such as history, or basket weaving, or geology. Why does everyone always pick on basket weaving? You can I blame 4chan. You can write a book about the topic, or explain and teach it. Professional skills are things you can do with knowledge. A professional skill can be used to carry out a task in that genre, such as cook a meal, record a podcast, or fix a flat tire. Oh, bit of meta. Your character sheet has all the information you need on the back about each skill they now have. And just for the sake of it, let's look at the Chapter 2 version of Apex. So he has three skills. 
Um, charm, persuasion, and professional skill artist. Each of them have an effect roll of 11. And then we go, we go to the beat down. And the the thing I want the thing I want to point out that's interesting is for each of the chapter sections, there's a there's a version of the of the pre gen character sheets for each, and it gra and it gradually expand it gradually expands with each chapter. Mm -hmm. Now in this case, the the um, attributes are expanded. There's two that are added. First is Constitution, the health and fortitude of a character and how healthy they are. Re and Recovery, how quickly you heal. Uh, there's also... I do, have, I do have to chuckle that they added, that they called the section about, stun about stunning Bonk. Bonk! Anyone who doesn't get that reference, you're too young. And it goes, in addition to being knocked out, a character can also be stunned. Someone who is stunned is dazed and unable to act or move until they get over being stunned, which takes their entire next phase. How does someone get stunned? After subtracting defenses, if the character takes more stun damage in a single hit than they have con, they are stunned. For example, if a character has 11 con and they take 12 stun damage, pass their defenses in a single hit, then that character is stunned for one phase while they stand dazed at half DCV and cannot act. Mm. In, the la in the last chapter, if someone got knocked out, they were, they were out, for the they're out for the adventure one and done. Now with the recovery characteristic, they can get back up again. Characters gain back an amount of stun equal to their equal to their wreck each phase that they recover, even if they are knocked out. Most low end most low end characters won't do that. If you put them down, they stay down. You can only recover by taking a full phase, doing nothing but resting up a bit. That means no movement, no combat, no skills. You can look around with a perception roll. You can talk, but that's pretty much it. While you're recovering, you're at half DCV and immobile. But you also get a free, no-time recovery at the end of Phase 12 each turn. That means you don't have to be half DCV or anything. It just happens automatically. Of course, bat the bad guys get this too. So, unlike some games that want that want you to ho that want you to hoard recovery or have a dedicated healer, no point in that when everybody has some degree of of healing on their own. Mm-hmm. Take notes, people. Uh, let's see. Then we have a th then we have a thing on area on area effect, um, and I have to laugh that we're using hexes instead of squares. But hexes are prettier. But if you know how AOE works in in any game with a grid, then you know how this works. So I'm ca so I'm kind of skimming that over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, and then it shows, then it says that there's some new stuff on it, including new attacks, just to use it. Although for some people they have new attacks. Chapter two version of Apex just still has punch. Apex punch. Then again, that punch does 10d6 PD damage, so yeah. But um, then we ha Let's see skimming da skimming down a bit because because I want to see if there's any th if there's any if there's any bit. Well, that on the GM section we do have we do have both it we do have both AOE and um rule. 
rules for character facing, and a convenient scatter diagram. Ooh. Scatter diagrams. We need more of those. It also mentions that it also mentions about some powers having charges listed with them. What this represents is a power that can only be used the listed number of times, then it is out of charges and can no longer be used. This might be a certain number of grenades or a certain number of shots that a blaster rifle can fire before it's out of power. Charges do not cost endur endurance, inst instead they have a limited number of uses. Once those charges are used up, they can only be used again the next day when more are loaded. So, pretty sta pretty standard fare on that on that front. Um, yep. So then we get to chapter three, and we ha and we add a few more characteristics: presence, endurance, and body, and some expan and some expansion for strength. But because of the fact that th that more things are added, they moved where the speed bar is. And because of the mm -hmm. fact that it's vertical and not horizontal, now I'm really thinking of FF10. <laughs> so, first is presence. Presence is personal charisma, force of personality, confidence, persona, um, bearing, I almost said persona, uh, and leadership qualities. Presence is what makes someone draw attention merely by being in a room or on screen without doing anything. It's what lets someone command when others are unable to draw attention. And since this was this was something that was made explicitly clear in the early days of D&D, &D, and it's still something that has to be made clear, presence is not necessarily tied to attractiveness. There's still there's still that narrative going about that chari that charisma is tied to looks. Even though the okay. DM's guide in D&D first edition out outright said this is not the case. I mean, Napoleon Bonaparte wasn't exactly a looker and he was charismatic as hell. Reminder that in Vampire presence is a talent that doesn't have to be that, that isn't you know inherent to the prettier vampires. Mm -hmm. So then we have endurance, your hardiness and level of fatigue. Most actions take some endurance to use, and the lower it gets, the less you can use without causing yourself harm. So. Your MP, basically. Mm -hmm. And body, this is how much damage you can sustain before you die. Death doesn't happen a lot in comic book settings. <laughs> Moving on. And when it does, mm -hmm. it's often just temporary, but it's a real thing. If a character's body goes below zero, you begin to bleed to death. Add a number of body equal to your starting score. That can that character dies. However, things have body too, not just people. You can break something by doing body damage to it. That's how you can crash through a wall or destroy a car, de dealing enough body past its defenses that it is ruined. Why am I thinking of the special stage in Street Fighter 2? I don't know. <laughs> Just don't do don't try and do that, folks. Goldberg learned that the hard way. <laughs> Tried to punch a window and broke his hand. Yeah. You gotta be very careful with how you do that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. But then we have the presence attacks. Presence attacks are a special kind of act that allows your character to use their impressive nature and axe words and the situation to influence others around them. This can be used to inspire, calm, impress, intimidate, or even terrify people. We like to do all at once. 
Consider mo consider moments in movies you've seen before when a character does or says something that makes everyone stop and stare in shock or even fear. A deed or a speech that compels everyone to take a note of action. That's a presence attack. You can do a presence attack at any time on your phase, though if you fail, it can make people pay less attention the next time, and the more often you do it, the less effective presence attacks become. Certain actions, such as great violence or heroism, ignoring damage that seemed terrifying, or things that you can otherwise make, make you seem awesome or amazing help with your presence attack. Properly done, you can get bad guys to surrender or at least stop and pause a moment, giving you a chance to act. You can also inspire others around you to courage and action. Presence attacks are based on your presence score. You get a base of 1d6 per 5 presence your character has. Your GM will modify this by circumstances and your actions. Some bad guys can do presence attacks against your character as well, and the higher your presence, the better you resist their effect. And okay. Then, yep. Oh. So we so we have something more direct for the diplomancer. More direct. You punch with your with your kindness and your courage and your leadership instead of punching with your fists. I want I want I did I tell you about the time I named my I named my battle axe kindness? Yes. We've talked about how you were going to kill them with kindness. Mm -hmm. But then we have Enduring. So how does Endurance get used up? On your character sheet, you now have a new column in the Blue Abilities section. This part shows the Endurance cost of each action. Every phase you use that ability, it costs you that much Endurance. In addition, any time you use your strength, it costs some endurance as well. One, one per ten strength exerted. So if you lift something using thirty strength, then it costs three endurance. Some powers are instant, cost endurance only on the phase used, like a blast. Some are constant, cost endurance every phase to keep going, like flight. If you use up all your endurance, you can still do things, but it's going to cost your stun instead. If you recover, you get back one endurance per point of recovery you have. Movement costs endurance to use, one per ten meter of, run of running and leaping and swimming. Mm. So, if you're so for all you Dark Souls players, there's your stamina bar. And honestly, the official Dark Souls TTRPG would have been better if it had, had a system like this. Instead of instead of that position thing that they did, which <sighs> we will pro we will probably have to dedicate a discussing video one of these days on how on how to go about getting the feel of Dark Souls in tabletop. It's not going to be an easy discussion. <laughs> Adaptate adaptation from one medium to another rarely is. I know. That's why FF Legend is taking so long. <laughs> uh, then we have all charged up. Some of the powers on the character. Oh, it's just going over charges, which we are, which we already talked about. Mm -hmm. So, and in this case, I'd say in this case, unlike unlike say the more ubiquitous RPG charges have a reason to exist because. You can't. Something can't take up endurance and ch and a charge at the same time, in the in this setup. Yep. If it has charges, it doesn't cost endurance. If it doesn't have charges, it costs endurance. Mm -hmm. And of course, it also has a good in-universe reason. You can't carry infinite grenades. No, you damn well could try. Do I have to bring up Blowtorch and Corkscrew? No. No, you don't. Unless you want to. I suppose you could then. Just Nade spam for days. That's why that's why I never played that's why I never played good COD on veteran. <laughs> Especially not World at War. I love World at War, but though but there but nobody had that many fucking grenades. There's usually one, maybe two, to an entire infantry unit. 
Mm-hmm. And any, anyways. So most attacks do most attacks that we that we've been using up to this point do long term body damage. And that and some some will do body and stun damage. And we have the whole thing with with normal damage. Look at the dice you've been rolling for damage. They've had body damage hidden in them all around all along. Each six you roll on each die does two body damage. Each every one you roll does no body damage at all. Any other result res deals one body. So all six, all 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 of your damage added up, so long as it isn't ones, is every die that you rolled for damage becomes body damage. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's slightly terrifying. Yeah. Especially for someone like a, uh, let's say a, uh, uh, Apex with his ten d six. That's with no ones, that's at least 10 body damage. Mm -hmm. Now, now, it goes, now you add these up normally to figure out how much stun damage you did. 20, in, so, in, with the example rolling 8d6. It's also doing body damage, 2 per 6, zero, 0 per 1. The easy way to do this is to take the number of die you rolled, 8 in this examples, as up the number of 6s you rolled, and subtract the number of the number of 1s. Yep. So 8 dice pl So 8 so it's 8 dice plus 2 minus 1 or 8 plus 2 plus 1 for a grand total of 9. Eight plus two minus one is indeed nine. Mm -hmm. Total the total the dice. Add the sixes. Subtract the ones. Yep, that's the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. You get your usual p. You get your usual pd or ed against any bo against any body damage done with a normal attack. That means that most of the time you won't take any body damage. The damage bounces off your defenses. Yep. And then we have killing attacks, which are a particularly lethal kind of attack that tends to do more body than stun damage and tends to bypass soft defenses. So things like knives, guns, claws, pitchforks, and so on. This kind of attack ignores normal PD entirely unless the character has some resistant defenses. This is R this is RPD or RED on the character sheet. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. If you don't have those, you take all the damage that it de that it deals. Oh, sometimes this is abbreviate, abbreviated as HKA or hand to hand or melee killing attack and RKA or range killing attack on character sheets. Also, I gotta love the fact that they put that they managed to snuck in a Princess Bride joke in here. Yep, he's only mostly dead. Mm -hmm. It's also a reference to uh, the death of Superman. Yeah. And the next section goes over what we what we just mentioned the the um the different the new types of the new the new resistant types of um PD and ED. So how do you deal killing damage? It's pretty much like normal damage. You roll the dice and count them up. That's how much body you did. Now roll a d3 or a d6 divided by 2. Multiply that by the body damage, and that's how much stun you did. So with a 1.5 d6, d6 ka, you roll 1.5 dice, and the result is the body. Roll d3, say a 2, and that gives you the bo that gives the body you rolled with the killing killing attack gives you the stun total. And that times the, bo that times the body attack. Ah. Words... He's he's forgetting how to word people. Don't worry about it. It happens to him. Mm -hmm. So then we have flashy. So your character might have a new attacker, 
on some character sheets called Flash. No, that doesn't mean indecent exposure. Flash is referring to a sudden sensory overload, like a burst of blinded light. You can flash... From behind? <laughs> you can flash any sense, disabling it for a short time, but almost all the flash attacks in this venture are sight flash. Flash attacks act kind of like body of a normal attack. You count the, d you count the dice, add the sixes, subtract the ones. That's not the body damage it does, it's the amount of time the victim is now affected by the flash. In this case, it's how long the victim of a sight flash attack is blinded in segments. So that bounty counting exercise above, that did 9 body. As a flash, it means the target is blinded for this phase and 8 more segments. If a character has flash defense, they reduce the period of blindness by that amount. 5 flash defense reduces the 9 segments by 5, so only 4 segments of effect. If you know it's coming and cover your eyes, you can usually ignore sight flash attacks as well. Usually. So what happens when you're blind? Well, you're 0 DCV against ranged attacks and half DCV against hand-to-hand -hand attacks. Plus the obvious. You can't tell where anything is. Indeed. Let's see, then we have focus, which is a fancy word for stuff you can use. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty vague. Yeah, it's just a device which can be used for its effects. There are two types. Obvious accessible foci, or OAF, stuff that's easy to spot and take away. And obvious inaccessible fo foci. An object clearly being used, but cannot be easily taken away. Also, like a rocket pod. Yeah, also there's the gag of not all foci are edible. Oh, then we have combat maneuvers. Up to now, you've been pretty limited in what you can do. Punch, kick, blast, etc. Well, there's a ton of other stuff you can do in combat, and here's how. There are six core combat maneuvers you can do in this chapter, with more on the way. Don't fret, we'll get to martial arts, but not just yet. Any character can use any of these maneuvers, I'll take a half phase to do. Only strike is listed on your character sheet, usually as punch, but anyone can use any of these combat maneuvers. So we have block, um, a lot to avoid a melee attack, then if both characters, blocker and block E, Act on the same phase next time. The blocker always moves first, regardless of dex. You can only block on your phase. For now, for now you can for now you can block before you normally can can act on your dex. Just roll to hit the attacker's OCV, not DCV. And if it succeeds, then you block the hit. You must declare you must declare an attack before any damage is rolled. If the dice hit the the if the dice hit the table, it's too late. It's too late to block. Mm -hmm. oh, then we have disarm. You roll. You roll to hit at minus two OCV, and then we and then you've grabbed that object. You can even use this at. You can even do this at range with an attack. Now, if the object resists being grabbed or is held by someone else, you'd have to fight for it. The defender rolls his their strength damage, and the attacker does the same. Whoever does the most body in this normal damage roll wins and gets control, either by taking or disarming the object. Ranged attacks just use their normal damage to determine the bot body damage and might break the item. <laughs> so then we have dodge. This grants plus 3 DCV to the character using dodge. Dodge only, ta dodging dodge only takes effects on... On attacks done after the attacks done after the character starts dodging, you can't dodge suddenly if someone already hit you. This works on all attacks. A dodge maneuver is not an attack and does not end your phase. See, then we have grab, like disarm, but lets you grab something or even someone. But unlike disarm, the player then controls that item or person until if they succeed. It works like a disarm, roll to hit DCV, and then a strength versus strength contest to gain control. 
If this succeeds, then the grabber can hold the victim or even pick them up and move them around if they have at least 15 strength. They can even squeeze the victim for punch damage. Escaping a grab can only be done on a character's phase, repeating a strength versus strength contest. You can even grab someone being held and try to pull them free. See, then we hey. have Haymaker, an all-out gonzo attack that sacrifices defense and takes a little extra time, but deals 4d plus 4d6 damage, or d6 plus 1 killing damage. Trying a Haymaker reduces the attacker's DCV by 5 and takes a little longer, but the attack landing at the end of the following segment. With the attack fall so if a character does a Haymaker on segment 6, then it doesn't hit until the end of segment 7. Now I'm really getting FF10 flashbacks. <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't played too much Final Fantasy. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, then we have Strike, which is your basic attack. And we then we have, which is why I'm skipping it. Then we have Trip, which flings a character to the ground, dealing strength damage like a punch. If they're moving, it does even more. It does an extra 1d6 per 20, mo per 20 meters they were moving. Which is pretty, f which is pretty fair. We've all, we've all tripped going full speed at one point. Can we trip someone out of midair? And if so, does it also do the same movement damage? That's right. I'm here to ask the hard hitting questions. Anyway, then we have rolling to hit. Most of these different combat maneuvers have adjustments to OCV and DCV, based on what you're trying to do. And that means your base OCV is not, isn't the same with every move. See, combat maneuvers adjust your basic attacks. A haymaker uses your usual attack, but in a different way, co which causes your DCV a penalty. So if you look on your character sheet, you'll now see that this chapter's version has a modifier for OCV and DCV with each attack type instead of a base roll. That's because that base roll will be adjusted by circumstances and what move you use. <laughs> so then we ha then we have hit them dice. So now how do you figure out your roll to hit? Well, here's a secret. Behind that 17 or whatever roll on your character sheet was a hidden way of determining your roll to hit not shown until now. Now that you're used to rolling to hit, you can see the guts of the process. To roll to hit, take your base OCV and add 11 to it. That's why a character with 6 OCV has a 17 roll to hit. Then you see, then you follow the same way as always. Roll C 3d6 and see if you roll under that. So 11 plus OCV minus 3d6, best DCV hit. Yes, I know, all mathy, but that's what we've been doing all along. Now you can do it from scratch for yourself. Then we get to ch chapter four, which first goes into r goes into um, range. And it looks like they used China, but made her anime. So better than China. I guess. Um, you that are you that are one of the girls from the Muscle Cafe. <laughs> So, uh, when a character attacks a target that is not adjacent to them, there will be a penalty to OCV based on the distance. Your GM will tell you what that modifier is, and the further away it is, the harder it is to hit. And then we have one of, one of my favorites when it, whenever I do bully builds, knockback. Basically, if you hit, you add up the body damage the attack did before defenses and roll 2d6 to, to subtract from that. Your GM will handle knockback in most cases, but this gives you a handle on what is happening. You can resist knockback too if you want. Just let the GM know before the attack is made. You can use your strength. And it go goes right into, sk goes right into um, skill levels. Um, 
let me see let me see if it goes into further detail on the GM side of things. Probably. Uh, that it does give it does give it does give modifiers for for the um for th for circumstances with presence attacks first off as well as it as well as a t as well as a table so i.e. i.e. how present how the bigger details on how resin's attacks work. Uh -huh. Oh. Many different circumstances in that. So for exa for exa for example, um add one D six for a good soliloquy or minus one D six if you're in combat. So roll one d six for each five presence that you that your character has, and apply that result to every character that can perceive and is aware of the, of their attack in the area. So if it's equal to the target's presence, they're impressed. If it's pre if it's equal to presence plus ten, they're very they're very impressed, and characters gain plus five presence only for resisting contrary presence attacks made that turn. If it beats presence plus twenty, they are awed. They won't act for a full phase. Are at half DCV and are likely to do what they're commanded to. If friendly, the target is inspired and gains plus ten presence to contrary presence attacks that turn. If it beats presence plus thirty, the target is overwhelmed. They may surrender, run away, or faint. They can take no actions for a phase and are at zero DCV. If the target is friendly, they are inflamed and will follow the leader into any danger, comply with requests, and gain a plus 10 presence to any contrary presence attacks that turn. Basically, a presence attack is an AoE buff debuff. Mm -hmm. So then they then they go into endurance, which we already covered. Then the whole thing with, with um, killing attacks, which we also covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we then we have the um, we have the maneuvers as we as we mentioned f further, but it also goes into full auto. A few powers in this scenario have auto fire listed. This allows a character to make multiple attacks on a target in a single roll. The character rolls an attack as normal with OCV versus DCV. Then for each two points they hit by, another attack lands from the attack. Autofire attacks have a maximum number of times they can hit in a single burst, five in this scenario. Example, Trigger Warning fires her machine gun at Avenger. She rolls to hit with her OCV of eight versus Avenger's DCV of six and hits by five. This means that she hits, one, that she hits once for her initial hit and then two more times for hitting by five. 2, 4, and 5 are not good enough for a third hit. Each attack is applied to Avengers resi resist P8 resistance PD um, se separately. Let's see, then we have Foci Flash that we which we've already mentioned. And then and then scrolling past that into chapter into its version of chapter four, because uh, I want to see about range. So you don't you don't start getting penalized for range modifiers until past until you're past nine meters. So minus one modifier at nine to twelve, then another at thirteen to sixteen, seventeen to twenty four, and so and so on. I'm just. I'm guessing that those uh, modifiers may not apply to certain foci. Possibly. Uh, and this is a penalty to, o to OCV, of course. Mm -hmm. And just and remember, a, lo a lower OCV means means the means the lower um, safety net that you have. Mm-hmm.
So, let's see, then we have we have the whole thing with combat maneuvers, although I like that they put the whole I I know kung fu. Yep. To that I say, show me. <laughs> so, it ends up adding a, f a few a few more actions that you that you can do. Um first is br is brace which negate which negates up to two range modifier penalties at the cost of making you of making you half dcv but it takes no time to do you can both brace and set set is a is a single phase you take very careful aim it takes a bit of extra time and the bonus ocv only works against the specific target aimed at if the attacker is forced to stop aiming at the target for any reason, the bonus OCV ends. But it can continue between phases. Mm -hmm. And I do things like things like grab by and move by, which in other games might have you might have been things you'd have to qualify into with feats or the like. I like that th that they're right out of the gate here. Yeah. Um, same thing goes with move through. There's also specific maneuvers for martial for martial arts. This is where we have chokehold and killing strike, as well as nerve strike. Uh, let's see, as well as weapon elements. But this is what this is what I was looking for was knockback. Mm -hmm. So if a character hits, they roll 2d6 and subtract the total from the amount of body rolled on the attack, whether any damage gets past defenses or not. If the result is positive, the target is moved 2 meters times the result. Nice. And if the result, obviously if the result is negative, there's no knockback at all. The example given is, if Apex punches someone for 11 body damage and the 2d6 roll is 6, then the victim flies 10 meters. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have resisting knockback. Like with a shove attack, a character with a half-phase action can resist knockback. Before an attack roll is made and has a half-phase action that halves their DCV, a character can declare that they'll use strength and or flight to resist knockback. For each five points of strength and every two meet and or every two meters of flight, they take minus two meters of knockback. However, this resistance is all or nothing. If the resistance does not reduce the knockback to zero meters or less, then they take it full, just as if they'd done nothing. Actually, in that case, it's worse for nothing because you just wait you just wasted an action. Mm -hmm. Wasted an action and your D and cut in half your DCV. Yep. So better make sure you have what you need. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we, then on the then there's the expand. There's some expansion when it comes to skill levels. And um. All th and all that this basically is is that is that you can't you can't use skill levels to for for other skip for other skills. If you have uh -huh. for, I, if you have skill levels for stealth skills, you can only use them to add to your skill roll in stealth, shadowing, concealment, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. uh, for skill levels, you just add whatever the total is, say three skill levels to your skill roll, making it easier to roll under that total. For combat levels, you add the amount you choose to your OCV or DCV, divided up however you want. Those stay in that proportion unless changed on your next phase. So, I guess to put it in more contemporary terms, things li things like things like power and precision attack, or d or defensive fighting, you're getting that right out of the gate with sk with skill with combat skill levels. You're just yeah. and you're able to shift how shift that how you'd like at any given time. Yep. Which I think is a good thing. Uh, 
Um, speed tricks, as I mentioned, is basically how how you can abort a maneuver, a a maneuver, and shift it to a, either dodge, block, dive, dive for cover, or roll with the punch. Mm -hmm. You know, for the for those of you, for those of you who are fighting game aficionados, this is basically canceling. Yep. Just not as romantic. Oh. And then we get to chapter five, which they open up with calling the final frontier. Mm. Because of course, because of course they do. Mm. Now, there's a few more characteristics that are added. O Ego, OMCV, and DMCV. So first is Ego. This is your character's willpower and is used for mental combat and making decisions or def or defying attempts to manipulate. It also helps resist meddling with your character's mind with mental powers. Then OC and then the mental equivalent, which is OMCV and DMCV. Or offensive offensive mental combat value and defensive mental combat value. For attacking or defending attacks on the mind, either helping hit or helping avoid being hit. Yep. Uh, then we have a bit of a thing with met with mental powers, namely mind link and telepathy, as well as mind attack. It's it mentions that um, mind attack mind attack only deals stun damage. No but damage is rolled as usual, but no body damage is done. Mental defense works the same way as P as PD and ED does. Then we have a thing on multiple attacks. Starting with starting with combined attacks. A character using a combined attack chooses several different powers and uses all of them on the same attack action. Each is rolled separately to hit. Each cost is appropriate endurance cost or charges. They must all be offensive attacks. You cannot do combined defensive maneuvers. Each power or attack used this way has to be different and cannot be a defensive maneuver, such as block or dodge, and they must all be used on the same target. Combined attacks allow characters to do combos of cool moves, but any attack that disables or weakens the target takes effect after all other attacks, so if you flash and punch someone, or trip and blast, the flash and the trip takes, takes effect after the other attack. So... For those of for those of you familiar with the storyteller system, here's your flur here's your flurry system. Although a bit kinder, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have multiple attacks, which they describe as a sweep or a cleave maneuver. Unlike combined attack, multiple attack can use the same attack more than once. To do a multiple, you declare that you're doing so, what attacks you'll be using, and what targets you'll be using them against. This takes up your entire phase and reduces your character's DCV to half until your next phase. You can use a multiple attack against a single target or against multiple targets that are in range. You make a separate roll for each attack on each target. For each attack past the first, your character suffers a minus two OCV penalty, cumulative. So if you attack five times, that's minus eight, zero for the first, minus two for the second, and so on, applied to every attack. Again, multiple attacks have to be attacks, not defensive moves. Endurance and charges have to be paid for each attack as normal. So here's your actual flurry. Mm-hmm. I would say multiple attacks is... Um, is like a... If I'm going to use a fighting game reference, like Chun Li's uh, super 
where she does all the kicks. That's mm-hmm. multiple attacks. But combination attacks or combined attacks are pretty simple. That's any cracked out FGC player doing a doing a full full HP to death combo across the entire. I was just I was just gonna reference custom combo from the Alpha series. Mm-hmm. Either either way. Then we have Tangled. Some ca- some characters now have a power called Entangle, which allows them to try and trap and trap and wrap up a target. Entangle works like a normal OCV attack. And then applies a con- a construct to the tar- to the target that has a PD, ED, and body. This could be webbing, a rope, a net, a steel bar wrapped around their body by a very strong character, whatever. To break free of this stuff, the victim has to do enough damage to destroy its body total, reduced by its defenses, which are resistant. Any stun damage done to an entangle has no effect. If they cannot break free, then they cannot move or use any foci. And are at zero DCV until they are freed or break out. And th- that that covers everything that's that's in the that's in the pl- that's in the player do- in the player document. Yep. Uh, let me see if there are any little details that I missed on the on the GM. Mm-hmm. Nope, not re- not really. There it There is There it there is a fu- there is a further list of telepathy effects. Mhm. IE IE what you need to what you need to roll. Oh. Yeah. Basic and it is it it basically goes basically goes into the um to the the level of difficulty for certain effects. Um though it also mentions multi powers which is about what you'd expect it to be. It's yeah. mentioned that it's mentioned that certain characters have multi powers, but it isn't. It's not like it go. It's not like it's going whole hog on the on the concept. But just to let me look at the let me grab the chapter five version of Apex. So we so we already met. We already mentioned that. We already mentioned that part. Um even even at the highest chapter he still has just t- he still has just punch for his att- for attack maneuvers. Mhm. Um And the but over overall I'd say th- I know, I know they, I know they try that. I came into this with the notion that champions isn't gonna, isn't all that daunting. Um, the hero system can have a few elements that might be that that are going to be a little crunchy, but I would still argue that it's not as crunch heavy as a lot of people think it is. A lot of the crunchiness with hero system, much like a lot of universal games, is pretty front loaded. Um. And with with a lot of the flirtations I've had with the hero system, I've always ha- I've always had a um, cheat sheet handy, mm-hmm. and I th- I think you I think you'd agree that that's some that's something that is going to be important is going to be important to utilize. Yeah, um, as we've said before, and we'll continue to say in the future, supers games are borderline to uh, you know universal games, and that necessitates a lot more statistics just so that you can be as universal as possible uh having a cheat sheet ready to track all of those things and make any easy reference is definitely useful mm-hmm. and 
I know I know the argument will be made that PBTA games like like um like masks show show that you can do rules light supers games. I have gone through masks and when it comes to power when it comes to power creation you're pretty you're pretty much given a you're pretty much given a blank square to describe your power. Mhm. Mm and with uh, with other ones that I've with other um rules light supers that I that I've seen um well, the worlds in peril which used fate treated powers as aspects and I've already made clear my problems with the aspect system. Um mm -hmm. Now Cor Cortex Prime d has 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 a I wouldn't say it ha I wouldn't say it has the same exhaustiveness of a power list as Hero System is going to have, but it's no slouch either. And I'm specifically referring to the power list as presented in uh Marvel Heroic. Mm -hmm. And this and besides, stuff stuff like Cortex Prime or Savage Worlds, I will always consider crunch medium. But the fact of the matter is because of how because of how many different archetypes are represented with supers of any universe. You have to ha you have to have a wide amount of powers to account for that, because people are people already learned their lesson, mostly that you that nobody that I won't say nobody but a minority of people want to go want to want to play as an established character when they when they sit when they sit down for sit for a superhero campaign. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would go so far as to say the majority would ra the majority would rather do custom characters. That's the reason why the very early run of Mar of Marvel Phase Rip didn't work, and why the Indiana Jones game definitely didn't work. Well, the TSR Indiana Jones game. The the um the west end version that didn't have that problem can't imagine why but i would i realized that this particular this particular episode of valley of the judge was a little bit more scattershot than our usual stuff the main reason for this is the is the fact that we had to jump between diff between different book between different books in order to kind of get kind of get a feel for this. It works very very well as an as a tutorial adventure, but the way that it's structured doesn't exactly work all that well for our format. Mm -hmm. Oh. But either either way, um, I'm cert it's there's certainly a lot of interesting th interesting things that can potentially be done, and I don't think I and Stephen S. Long was not lying when he when he said that one of the appeals of Hero System is that you can build just about anything. I realize that, that I realize that you can say that with a lot of Universal games, but. I do think you can make it significantly tangible without fo without falling into certain traps. Yeah. What I'm saying is that while you can do while you can make any kind of character in GURPS, you're going to have people who are going to min-max because of how it's designed. I would actually argue it's a little bit harder to min-max with Hero System. It's still gonna happen. It's just a little bit trickier, if only because you've got mo more moving parts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's I will. However, I will freely admit that one of the problems that I do have with Hero System, and this is very much a me problem, is the roll roll the roll low roll roll high thing. I'm not opposed to roll low mechanics, nor am I opposed to roll high mechanics. 
What I've always had issues with is when is when you do, is when you try and do both. And while I can certainly get used to it, I mean I pl I mean I played AD and D for years. Um, mm. I'm not the biggest fan of it personally. I suppose I suppose in, I suppose in that regard, it's not too surprising that anybody who runs Hero System for any amount of time has Hero Designer on their computer, or ha or has Hero Lab, or probably both for that matter. Certainly doesn't hurt that he that Hero Designer is dirt cheap, and there's plenty there's plenty of um, support for it. Mm -hmm. But that is going to do it for this particular episode of Valley of the Judge. This was a in betweener. We will have we will be back to something a bit bigger because since I, since I ended up ha since I ended up having them on and ha and have talked and have talked with them and dra and dragged you into the picture. <laughs> Next week we are we are tackling something five E adjacent. But also something for us filthy, filthy fucking weebs. Next week, we begin our four-week odyssey into Magi Knights. Yes. Yes! Full so, disclosure, uh, he's already given his side, but mine is, full disclosure, I'm slowly corrupting the designer and his wife. <laughs> there are multiple ways that, that can be taken, but it, but at the very I least, know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but th those two are, those two are cool people, as was made clear in in um the interview that they did with uh, that they did with me, and the time that you were on one of their Q and As and um brought your particular brand of chaos. Yes, indeed. But that'll do. But that'll do it for this week. As always, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.